raison d'etre in, in our center because it shows how important spatial information is for going into STEM. So the, this is a, you can think of it as a three-dimensional graph, um, Y, X, and then the arrows represent the Z axis, and I'll explain. The X axis here is this SAT math score, which is our, uh, one of our standard college admissions uh, test scores, and the Y is the SAT verbal, same thing. They've normalized it so here that zero is the average score. Okay, and then what the arrows represent is the important thing. It's how much more predictive ability did we learn by knowing spatial score. So you might notice, for example, that the engineering, electrical engineering, is very long. And what this is telling us is that if I want to understand from eighth grade on who will likely go into STEM, or particularly engineering, and I, you're giving me three tests, verbal, math, and spatial. And I want to take a guess of which of these students is most likely. The spatial test is by far the most predictive. So it's something important. And this is after holding constant these other contributions. Now you might note the negative side too. There are fields where spatial ability is less predictive or less important or pr negatively predicts going into these fields. But this is one of several sets of evidence that uh, makes the empirical case that spatial, important, spatial ability, spatial thinking is important in STEM. Now, people have known this for a while. The question is, what can we do about it? As the National Research Council said in 2006, spatial thinking is presumed throughout the K-12 curriculum, but is formally and systematically taught nowhere. That was in 2006, just about the time our center was sort of coming into being, and we think we are, have begun to change that somewhat. Certainly, it's not taught as much as math or verbal, but we've tried to come up with ways to introduce it into the curriculum. The question I want to address now is, why is spatial ability related to STEM? And when we explore possible answers to this, we actually find that there are some possible targets for intervention, actually quite late in life, in, in college-age students. So, it's, you know, it's important to start early, but old dogs, or at least college-age dogs, can still learn new tricks. So, um, and we can make interventions even after students enter the university, if we understand why. So let's first consider a common explanation that turns out to be only partly true. And that common explanation is that STEM fields are highly spatial, so you need high spatial ability to do well. This seems you know, very obvious. Uh, for example, a geologist, a structural geologist, needs to be able to think about the patterns and forces that created the folds and faults that, that made these mountains. Or in chemistry, um, you definitely need to be able to think about spatial structures. Chirality is perhaps the best known example, some, many students struggle with these spatial principles. I'm fond of saying that the greatest source of psychology students is the organic chemistry class. And the reason is because they struggle with the spatial reasoning and they come knocking on our doors and say, Dr. Utah, I found out that I don't like science so I want to be a psychologist. This to us is, is you know, hurts because <laughs> we are, and I hope we've convinced you on a science, on a, I may sound a little defensive about it right now, but really, we, we are a science, and it's not the place to go if you don't like science. Okay. So you could say it's just that spatial ability matters because these fields are spatial. But actually, when we start looking at the data and looking at expertise and novices, it's not so simple. Spatial ability becomes less predictive as we move through the science education process. As we take novice students, those who are just beginning college, and we turn them into engineers or geologists. Spatial ability actually becomes less predictive. And this is going to say something very interesting about when and how we might want to intervene. But let me uh, give you a couple examples first. So we'll consider, there's many, this, this analysis has been done in many different domains. The data are variable. I think the best data is in geoscience. Some pretty good and interesting data in chem chemistry. I could also do other fields where the same argument has been made empirically. But I'll just do these two today. Okay, this is my favorite study of this domain because it involves real-world scientific teaching and practice. Uh, Zach Hambrick and his colleagues uh, studied the abilities that predicted novice and expert geologists field work. So he started with, um, in the summer at Michigan State University. Yes, is after the first year 
of the student's curriculum, and they go from Michigan to Montana for a week where they do this field work. And he asked, what cognitive abilities predict uh, how you will do in this field work? And one of the tasks is this geological mapping task where you have to think about the uh, features not only that you see, but what's below the Earth that may have caused this, and importantly, as you see, the spatial relations and the patterns between them, that the sense of distribution is where we think about land masses. And so it's a very important skill. And he made up a, a, a dependent variable here on the y-axis of a accuracy, which is really a summation of several different measures to see how people did on this geological mapping test. And what this graph is, is showing you is that it, spatial ability matters very much for those who are novices. These are first-year college students. But it doesn't predict performance at all for the uh, high geography knowledge. So this is the first bit of data that's consistent with the argument I'm making that as you become an expert, spatial ability actually becomes less predictive. So maybe you don't have to be a spatial genius to be a scientist but we have to understand more what's going on. For the statistically minded, you might be wondering, is this just restriction of range? Are there actually any low spatial ability geologists? Uh, there, there are. Not that many, but there are some. And how they got to be geologists with low spatial ability is an interesting story in its own right. Okay, another example from chemistry. As I've already mentioned, chemists have to think about spatial relations all the time and they struggle with way, ways to represent to their students the third dimension uh, in space. There are many different forms of representation, uh, standardized ways of doing this, and students struggle with it. Now, what Mike Steef did in his dis dissertation is a fascinating study of expert and novice chemists um, thinking about chemically relevant stimuli, such as these, and irrelevant stimuli, or random stimuli, these are what we call Shepard Metzler objects. These, after the name of the people who came up with them, they are deliberately decontextualized. There are, to my knowledge, at least not when they were made, no experts in this. That would be kind of a wasted expertise. This is worth studying, but this may not be worth studying. So they, they deliberately took it out of context to sort of study spatial ability without any semantic knowledge. Now, there's a tremendous amount of evidence. This is two-dimensional, these are three-dimensional, but it really doesn't matter. There's a tremendous ma um, amount of evidence that people use a process called mental rotation to solve problems like these. Are these two the same? One is rotated, or are they mirror images? Likewise, is this a normal R, the letter R, rotated, or is it a mirror image? If it's a mirror image, uh, chiral, in the chemical <coughs> sense, we cannot rotate it into alignment. We could flip it, but just the rotation in the single plane will not make them align. And so, going back to the late 60s, people did research on how people uh, made these decisions. And they found that there's a very strong relation between how much the stimulus is rotated relative to the target and how long, that's reaction time, it takes you to make this decision. Everybody understand what's going on here? So, the, this is taken as strong data that what's going on mentally is that people are treating it as if they are rotating it. Once again, a strong relation between the body and the, and the mind and between vision and motor skills that we heard about quite a bit um, in some of Andy's work. So um, this is evidence for the mental rotation process. And everybody do does this for these kind of things on the right. The question is, what do chemists do? And Mike Steve, in a fascinating study, I don't have the data, but I can talk about it. Um, he looked at expert and novice chemists uh, solving problems like this and solving problems like this. At a geometric level, they're the same. They require the same degree of geometric transformation, and that's important. But to a chemist, these are entirely different problems because this knowledge over here is actually relatively simple. Th this has become, for a chemist, a semantic fact that knowing whether the molecule is chiral, whether it can be rotated or not, is part of knowing its chemistry. And therefore, they just know it as a fact. And then empirically, when he did the mental rotation, this line was low and flat. They did not have to mentally rotate. The chemists were able to make decisions very quickly, and there was no effect of the degree of rotation, suggesting they're using a very different mental ability. That is, 
It has now become a semantic fact. They know that, and they can retrieve that fact quickly, regardless of the degree of mental rotation. But you could be arguing, should we, well, maybe chemists are just really good spatial thinkers, but when we, and, and maybe to some degree that's true, when we looked at, when Mike, <laughs> excuse me, looked at the um, chemists with these figures, exactly the same as regular Northwestern undergraduate students. They use the same process because these figures have no meaning to anyone. These figures on the left have a lot of meaning to chemists, but not to introductory psychology students. So um, this is suggesting why spatial ability might matter at the beginning, but matter less as you become expert in your field. The nature of the decision process changes. The same thing, by the way, happens in chess. As you become an expert chess player, uh, you are able to embed patterns of attack in sort of whole streams of activity. This is the defense against this attack. And you think less about particular spatial patterns between um, pieces. And therefore, spatial ability, as measured by the standard tests, becomes less predictive. So what I'm saying in this first part of my talk is, it, as, as you become an expert, this sort of raw spatial ability as measured by psychometric tests actually becomes less predictive. And we can talk about whether that would be true in all disciplines, but importantly, this is going to open up an opportunity for when we can make a difference. Okay. Um, okay. So, that. okay. so this, is a, this is what we have to explain. Now. I've already demonstrated there is a strong positive correlation between uh, spatial ability and going into a STEM field. But the curious part is that experts don't, it doesn't seem to matter for experts. This seems incongruous. This is a paradox we need to explain. What's going on? And my theory is, this is the second use of the term gatekeeper today. Uh, and gatekeepers really matter because they are the things that keep people out. And we want to open those gates up and let more people, and particularly more women, into STEM. So, Spatial ability is a STEM gatekeeper. Spatial ability matters a great deal early on in STEM learning, learning, but it becomes less important as domain-specific knowledge is acquired. As you become a geologist, as you become a chemist, you learn these as semantic facts and are able to problem solve, at least in relatively simple problems, without thinking spatially. You're learning the knowledge of your field. You avoid spatial transformation when you can. You know, it's, mental rotation is fun to talk about, but it's actually hard and rather slow. You know, it's taking two or three seconds to do these things and in, in problem solving time, you know, somebody else just won the Nobel Prize while you're sitting there spinning it around in your head. So um, it's not the preferred process. It's hard, it takes all of your attention, you really can't think about anything else while you're doing it. So it's much easier to recall a semantic fact than it is to sit there and spin it around in your head. What this means then is that the young undergraduates or late high school students when they're first learning, they do have to spin everything around in their head because they do not yet have the semantic knowledge. Do you see what I'm saying? So um, that means spatial ability is very important in the first phases of learning, but actually becomes less for it. And now you get to the, um, the gateway idea. Everybody know what a catch-22 is? It's an unresolvable paradox. So spatial ability becomes less predictive as you move through, but you can't th get there because of low spatial ability. So is there any place we can find uh, purchase on this and, and try to resolve it. Can we open up that gateway? Um, but before I get there, let me ask, I'm not saying spatial ability never matters for experts. I do think at the very highest levels that uh, probably spatial ability starts to matter again. This is not, at least at the time, this was not a semantic fact. This was a new discovery. It has become a semantic fact. I had to memorize all the bonds of the, the different ways that the proteins and DNA and RNA could form um, acids, whatever. Um, <laughs> I became a psychologist. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so this is a new insight. Kekulé had a new insight at the time. And those new insights might indeed call complete spatial thing. But it doesn't mean we should keep everybody out of STEM just because they're not likely to make ground shaking new discoveries. We can have a lot more people who are competent in STEM, even despite low spatial ability. Okay. So what can we do to help? And this argument hopefully opens up some possibilities. And I'm going to give you two answers to that. One is what I call spatial training, which is sort of improving the core spatial abilities, like mental rotation. 
And another is a, a sort of higher level, more contextually oriented approach where we look at spatial problem solving in context, where we try to take science students and make them approach um, problems and problem solving as spatial in nature. And I'll briefly describe both. So by spatial training, I would mean something like, you know, the most boring one and the one that most people do is simply training people to do these. Or, and you will get better with time and experience. We actually can eliminate the sex difference. It takes about 21 days of constant training to do it, but it can be done. This is really boring, and it's really hard to get people to do it, but some people are able to do it. Fortunately, there are other ways to do it. Uh, yesterday, we heard a lot from Daphne Beverlier about video games. Video games seem to have a strong uh, influence on spatial, spatial attention specifically. The amount of spatial information you can, you can uh, attend to at once goes up as you become an expert um, spatial video game player. But even um, different experiences like dress design, anything where you have to exercise your spatial ability seems to lead to moderate but important improvements. And as I'll show you in a second, these improvements can transfer. Okay, so this comes from a meta-analysis that I did with several of, including Nora Newcomb, who's the leader of our center. And we looked at the meta-analysis as a systematic way of putting together the results of many different studies. Even though they're measured on different scales, we can put them together as effect sizes to see how strong the intervention was and did it make a difference. And we did this for over 200 uh, studies, 217 in fact. Importantly, more than half of those were unpublished. Why would you want to include unpublished studies? Well, the answer is that there's very often publication bias. The studies that find the strongest effects are most likely to get published. And this means when you put it together systematically, you could be overrepresenting the effect. So that's why it's very important that we were able to obtain, largely through unpublished dissertations, um, the unpublished data. So now the results can be summarized quite quickly. <laughs> training works, training lasts, and training transfers. Okay, so there you go. Let me explain that a little bit. The mean effect size after taking control groups into account, this is really important. This is above and beyond an active control. So somebody who's doing something, uh, but not something that would be expected to improve spatial ability. And the, the average effect size is 0.43. That's uh, 0.43 standard deviations after training you've improved by 0.43. This is classified as a moderate thing. It's roughly equivalent to seven or eight IQ points. Now, it's moderate. Moderate's important when you scale that over a lifetime. And just to sort of um, anchor this, um, the effect size for aspirin, you know, we take aspirin to prevent heart attacks, is 0.08. And yet anybody with any uh, possible danger of having a heart attack, at least in the United States, is taking a baby aspirin every day. And uh, it only, it, you have to treat literally almost 1,000 people to prevent one or two heart attacks. But that's worth doing at a population level. This is much stronger than that. So we really, so it's not enormous, but it's very carefully controlled and it could make a big difference. So it's roughly about seven to eight IQ points that we've shifted the distribution. Um, now, the argument for, po for training lasts. Most studies don't study training past uh, one or two sessions. That's just the, you know, what they do. They train them and they look. And that's um, unfortunate because you know, for this to make an educational difference, it has to last. But about 25% of the studies we analyzed did include some delay. So they measure the effect later. And amongst those, there actually was no significant decline one week or even a month later. Now, you should take this you know, with some skepticism because those studies that know they're going to measure delay use more intensive treatment. But it at least shows there is the existence proof, the possibility that we can make training last, and some do. Uh, training transfers, what, so if I bring you in to do mental rotation and you improve, but you improve on nothing else at, at all, then that's not educationally relevant. There aren't enough studies that have looked at spatial training to STEM, which is the claim we're making. There's some and I'm doing some now. But when people look at transfer to other tasks, for example, mental rotation training to video game playing, they did find these transfer effects, which is very, very important for spatial training to make any difference in STEM. Okay, so, so what? 0.43, yeah, moderate effect, you know, who cares? Uh, 
Um, put this into a, uh, a, a population context. Remember that I said that engineers had substantially higher spatial ability. Their mean of spatial ability is 1.51 standard deviations above the mean. That's a big effect. Um, and we didn't reach that. We reached port 0.43. So some people have said, well, that's not enough to make anybody an engineer. That's not quite. You have to think in terms of distributions. We are shifting the distribution to the right. So the darker area is before training, and the lighter area is after training. The percentage or proportion of the population that meets the spatial criterion to be an engineer is nearly doubled by a 4.43 intervention. So it could make a big difference at an at a individual level and a pop, by going through a population effect. So it could, in theory, double the number of people who are spatially qualified to be engineers. Now I said, okay, so the, the holy grail in this, in this line of research is studies where you do spatial training and then see if it improves STEM. Those are really hard to do. Psychologists aren't so good about doing the long-term longitudinal studies that really would show these effects because we tend to study things that can be done relatively quickly in the laboratory. Fortunately, other, like STEM educators, have looked at the longer term. Um, one of the problems with many of these studies is the problem of self-selection, that students who are motivated to do better or think they have spatial problems would be more likely to take the training. Um, Cheryl Sorby and her colleagues got around this problem in a very clever way, which, call, which is called a regression discontinuity, where um, she has this course at Michigan Tech, which is sort of a mid-range um, engineering school. So they want to be engineers, but a lot of the students struggle to become engineers. And so anything that she can do to pr improve retention is critically important. So for many years, going back into the 90s, she ran a spatial class that was designed to teach spatial thinking in an engineering context. And not, it did that, it led to more retention, and it also improved calculus scores pr pretty reliably. So something seemed to be working. But you could never tell if it was a problem of self-selection or not. Maybe those are the people who wanted to get better, and they took the class. So Cheryl, very creatively, got the class to be required. So now every engineering student at Michigan Tech has to take this class in their first year. And then we have what's a re regression discontinuity, where there is no self-selection, and we look and see, because everyone has to do it, and we compare before that point and after. And we do find an, a causal effect now that it actually does lead to improvement in spatial, in STEM. So this is sort of the holy grail and shows it's possible. We are now doing a more controlled experiment. I'm working with her, just got a grant to do a randomized control trial of her intervention in 53 schools, if they all stay in, um, and across several different places in the US to see if we can, with eighth graders, make a difference not only in their scores, but also in the classes that they choose in the gender distribution, things like that. Okay, so I've talked to you about the spatial training. And, you know, the mind isn't a muscle. You can't just improve it. It helps to, to do this, but it's not going to be enough to completely change the world. That would be naive and kind of a magic bullet. It's not a magic bullet. We also want to think about whether and how we can enhance spatial thinking in sort of real world context. I think we need both approaches, this bottom-up, train the raw core ability, and this more top-down, where we think about scientific and engineering problem solving and try to put it into a, a context where spatial thinking becomes important. So students of today will face like the climate change. Uh, this example, does anybody know what this is illustrating? This is, this is the first recorded hurricane, if I understand it correctly, to hit Brazil, I think it was 2003 or 2004, which is, what? Caterina, yeah, exactly. Which is a horrible harbinger of climate change. You know, this is cold water out here. It shouldn't be happening, um, but it does. And so, you know, we're, these are the kinds of uh, problems that our um, students will have to face um, as the climate continues to change. And they're very spatial in nature. What is the distribution and pattern uh, of, the, of the ocean currents and wind currents and sun? And how is that affected by the distribution of ozone and all these things are all you know, spatial questions. In the United States, at least, there's a lot of emphasis on science education reform that one of the theories that we, the reason that, that students don't really like science is that we've made it a bunch of disconnected facts. 
and you have to memorize, and, and we lose the joy of the process. You know, science can be fun. It's a sort of disciplined fun. It's not fun every minute, but making a scientific discovery, testing a hypothesis, and seeing it through is, is really quite engaging in a sort of natural curiosity sense. And so uh, educational practice now tries to emphasize, at least in 11 states, the um, science as practice, that you should be able to do these kinds of things. Interpreting data, creating models of it, is, a process, is something that you need to do across different domains of science. And we don't have to build these silos between chemistry and physics and biology because they have these common uh, characteristics. This is just good science. Now what my colleague Bob Colbert and I are doing are trying to um, take a spatial approach to making this happen. And so work Bob has created the geospatial semester, which is an intensive spatial problem solving uh, course in, a high school, in a, many high schools now in Virginia. And we're doing research now to see not only is it effective, but we, we, we've partnered with the neuroscience to see if it changes um, how the brain processes spatial information. Uh, and we're optimistic that, it, that we'll be able to find that through a fMRI studies. Okay. So the main technology that we use here is something called geographic information systems, or GIS. And the critical thing about this is layering of different levels of information. And a, a recent analogy I think kind of helps. How many people have different electronic calendars? Perhaps you have your social calendar, your work calendar, your church calendar, you, you know, and then you combine them together. Maybe, well, anyways. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. So those are each layers. They're, they're looking at layers of time. And by analogy, GIS does the same with space. It creates layered representations of data of interest. So when you're solving a problem, you want to look at different kinds of data, look at it in multiple different ways, and doing it spatially allows for patterns to emerge, and, and you can see the important distributions. So for example, the classic example is, where would you put the next Starbucks coffee? I have not seen many in Brazil. They are everywhere in the United States. In fact, that question is now meaningless. We don't need any more Starbucks. So I would put the next one in hell if I had a choice. Um, so, but 10 to 15 years ago, sorry, Seattle. Ooh, that was bad. <laughs> it started in Seattle, Microsoft and uh, Starbucks. Yeah. Um, and lots of other wonderful things. Uh, so this, um, but if you were trying to find where to put the next Starbucks, you might want to think of like, what's the distribution of income? What's the distribution of parking? What's the distribution of land parcels? It's a marketing decision. It's a scientific and engineering decision. Now, to give you an example of whether this course is effective and how it, it changes students' thinking, I want to give you a, um, demonstrations of their final projects. Uh, yes, these are cherry-picked. These are some of the very best, but um, many of them are very good. So this is a quite recent one, completed in May of this year, where the student asked the question, how can we make internet available in areas like maybe the Amazon or Africa where the infrastructure is not there to support it? And Google and many other companies are experimenting with some sort of airborne wireless system. Some have said do it with drones. Some have said do it with uh, balloons. This sounds like Jules Verne science fiction, but actually it's not very far away. This will be a way to bring the internet to people who, who don't have it now. And this student um, said, well, where do we start? What's the best place? And he took sort of both an engineering and almost a business perspective on this. If we're going to make this investment, where's the best place in Africa to do it? So he looked at some data on where the internet has penetrated. Uh, then he looked at political instability. You can't have these things flying around if they're in a no-fly zone. For example, in some of these countries have no fly zones where there can be no airplanes unless the government has authorized it. So that's not a good place to put flying drones. So that's another kind of data that he's visualized. And then, you know, it does affect mathematical reasoning. He came up with a formula that took into account uh, political instability, need, and access, and things like that. And based on that, he identified Namibia and Botswana as the two best places to start. Uh, based on all of these factors, what I'm trying to illustrate here, it's not a one-dimensional decision. This is real-world problem solving with multiple constraints. And patterns and distributions are critically important. So these two are the places to start. 
And then he went about the physics of trying to decide the patterns of how these things should fly over. Basically, Google take this plan and just implement it. He's, he's done a lot. Of, I hope he gets compensated because he, he did a lot of really good work. Here's another one, sort of a more rural example. This is from a rural high school in Virginia near Shenandoah National Park. And one of the problems they have is Shenandoah National Park is it's not populated, but it's not isolated. There, there are many houses that, that line up right against the border of the park. And so the animals, such as the bears here, can come into people's backyards. And that's not good for the bear, and it's not good for the people. This is something we are motivated to prevent. So, you know, people, the park rangers would just take them back up and dump them out and say, please don't come back. But that didn't work so well because um, there are many constraints. This is one of those real world problems. A bear is a large animal. You can't just put it into your Toyota and go up into the mountains and dump them all. On the other hand, if you get a truck that's big enough, then you need a, a road that can accommodate that truck. And this is a national park with this great emphasis on preservation. So you really have to think about these multiple constraints. And based on all this kind of data, road distribution, bear incident distribution, uh, elevation, things like that, he came up with target zones in the central and southern zones to say that these are the best areas, given all these constraints, to put the bears back. And again, it's illustrating at a very local level this time the kinds of problems that involve multiple distributions and constraints and real world problem solving. And the National Park Service has adopted some of his recommendations because he didn't have the tools to think about it quite this way. So he's actually changed how he's approaching the problem. Okay, so we did a more systematic study of wh whether and how this course is making a difference. Um, so one of the we looked at their final projects, but we also asked them the training uh, transfer questions. That does it change not only the final project that they did, but their approach to a new problem. So here's one transfer problem. If you were running a campaign for local political office, how would you go about running your campaign? This is not inherently spatial. It could be spatial, but it doesn't have to be. And I'll give you two examples of students solving it in a spatial and non-spatial way. I want you to listen to what he says, but also uh, watch his gestures. This is interesting. I used my own computer so that this wouldn't happen. Well, I do have his transcript. I, I, that is bizarre. Um, OK, so he moves his hands and he makes maps. And he says, first, I would use probably something GIS related to find an area that would probably maybe suit like my platform. like." Say I was for gay marriage, which is now just last week, legal in all 50 states. Um, it was not at the time, uh, so that would have been something he would have to campaign for. So I'd like to do a map. So he's thinking about representation, he's thinking about data, and he's thinking about plotting it. And as you l listen and watch, you can see several of these um, scientific and engineering practices coming through. He's seeing this as something that requires data, that requires that he represent data, that he think about the most relevant points and so it's definitely a spatial problem. I can't, let me, I have, this is, this will puzzle me for months to come. Why this um, I didn't intentionally pick, pick the genders here. Women can do very well in this too. But in this particular case, it's not that she doesn't do well, but she doesn't see this problem as spatial. She says, I would seek the support and the, both the sort of political support and financial support of local businesses. And she gives very good reasons for that. Not just because of money, but because they're sort of points of contact for people. And you reach different people. Everyone you know, has to go to the grocery store, things like that. So she makes a very good case, but she doesn't think about mapping or relations at all. And she was in our comparison group. Let me give one more final bit of data that I think is really showing that this is working. And it's based on a really simple assumption, starting with James Pennebaker, which is that what people talk about, and more specifically the words they use, is a pretty good approximation of what they're thinking. You're like, duh, but it actually, you know, in psychology we sort of fought that for a long time in behaviorism, uh, and so this would turn out to be pretty interesting. And he did this with a clinical psychology. He collected a lot of diaries of people in therapy, and he noticed that there were these changes that were predictive of whether they were getting better. If you start mentioning happy and joy and things like that, you can just count those kind of happy words, and it's a, it correlates about 0.7 with the clinician's rating of your improvement. 
And we used a similar technique for analyzing spatial words. So as we're listening to people explain how they would solve these different problems, we code the number of spatial words that they use, not and counting each one just once. So you can't just say right, 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 left, 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 and get a whole lot of credit. These are unique parts of the explanation. So our, our claim here is that they're thinking more spatially, and we think that this change in how they describe things is evidence for that. So let me wrap up. Uh, spatial melody matters for STEM, but perhaps not for the reasons typically assumed. It matters more at the beginning. And that means we can do something about it. And we also know from the meta-analysis that spatial ability is moderately malleable. And there are things we can do. And uh, we need to also think about doing it in context. Uh, so thanks to NSF, Bob Colbert, and many other people. And thank you. <coughs>